Good morning. It is wonderful to be with you as we kick off this series of lessons on fortifying the family. I uh, just loved getting to know the, the few of you I've been able to meet so far and look forward to spending these next few days with you. Let's begin with a prayer. Our Lord and Father, we are humbled to be before your throne. We're thankful to be able to gather here as a family to do so freely and to open your word and, and study what you have to say to us. We're thankful for the body and blood of Jesus, which we've just remembered, and for the salvation and uh, the, the grace and, and all of the blessings, the hope that it gives us. And we pray that we would live in that hope and uh, live under his lordship as he's our king and, and lord, and that we would follow the ways that you set before us. Bless me now as I preach to say things that are true, to say things that would uh, help each of us grow closer to you and in, in our walk, and bless us through this time uh, today through Wednesday. Lord, if it be your will, that this will be a blessing to each family here and, and each one uh, who's able to hear your word. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You are born with very few things. You might remember in Job where he says, Naked I came from my mother's womb, naked I will return. But it's not true that you come into this world with absolutely nothing. There are a few things that are predetermined for you when you come into this world. The first of those actually, thanks to modern technology, we find out about pretty early on, and that's your, your sex, your gender. You're, are you a male or a female? I've got my four kids, as, as was mentioned in the introduction. And I vividly remember the appointments for all of them, uh, hearing it's, it's going to be a little girl, hearing it's going to be a little boy, hearing it's going to be a boy and a girl. Thankfully, I, I knew ahead of time going into that because uh, that would have been quite the shock to find out uh, at that time. But you, you come into this world with that predetermined, you are going to be a man someday or you're going to be a woman someday. Beyond that, you come into this world with a name with the name of your parents. Uh, some are, are adopted from birth, and so you take on that name. Others, it's, it's the, the lineage of your, your biological mother and father, and you come into this world with a name. That means something. That carries weight. That determines certain things, because along with that name come genetics. The, 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 we, we say, well, we, it's, it's in the blood. And it's technically, yeah, it's in the blood, but all the way down to your genes, there are things that are determined by your biological mother and father. I was walking through Walmart uh, one day a few months ago and my son Robbie waved at somebody and the, the man waved back at him and the man kept walking and then stopped and did a double take and he said, he looks exactly like you. Well, the poor kid, he kind of does. I mean, that's just, he, he can't escape it no matter, he could try and change his name, he could try and reverse some of those things, but he can't help that he bears those genes of a Wilkie. We come into this world with those things but it's interesting that when you look at the world around us today, it's those things that are under attack. It is your identity as part of a family. It is your connection to the people around you, to your mother and father and to the next generation. And we're going to get into the details of how that's under attack. The obvious one is that your, your sex, your, whether you're male or female, is under attack with the idea that you can choose your pronouns, that it's, it's up to you. In fact, there are parents these days that will have a child and instead of having that appointment where they're told hey, it's a boy or it's a girl, and instead of having, I guess, what's popular now, the gender reveal party, they don't do that. They say, well, that's not my job. I'm going to let the child decide for themselves. I'm going to let them, I'm going to give them a kind of a neutral name, and they, if they don't like that, they can even change the name later on. They can be whoever they want to be. They're this blank slate left to their own determination. That's severing them from the parents that came before them, and the grandparents, and the great grandparents, and this whole line of people all the way back to Adam and Eve that led to them to this point today to say, nope, they are their own independent, existing individual. That's not a coincidence that it's these very basic things that are under attack. And again, we see this uh, years ago when homosexuality really started picking up momentum in our culture. There's a problem with that. Again, that I, I started this off saying you're born with very few things. Uh, in your mother's womb, you already are, are starting to form who you're going to be. But a man and a man can't have a baby, and a woman and a woman can't have a baby. And so Romans 1 tells us very clearly that it's unnatural, that these, these desires that are being pursued. But now we've got science that says, well, a man and a man can have a baby. They can just essentially rent a woman out to have the baby for them. And, and we can biologically put a baby together, and now they've got their own child. And so science is, is contributing to these things and, and trying to make that possible. And I mentioned transgenderism and the surgeries and the, the hormone treatments and all the things they put people through to say, well, you came out a boy, you didn't want to be a boy, you want to be a girl, let's make that happen. It's 
not a coincidence, again, that these building blocks of who we are, all the way down to the most fundamental things, the first things we know about you as a person are under attack. Why? There's a word called, uh, a word that the, the term is atomization, breaking you down to the uh, atom level, A-T-O-M, the most basic things. Everything in this room is made up of atoms, and so to atomize something is to take it down to the elements that make it up. That's what we're doing to culture, to society, to families, is break everything down to its smallest unit, which is the individual, and separate all of those individuals. Now, why would ha Satan have an interest in doing that? In separating you from a church family, from a society, from a culture, from the people around you, and also from your own family? Why would he do that? You ever watch those wildlife shows where the lion is prowling and he's looking for the zebras? Which one does he eat? The one that breaks off from the pack. The one that has been atomized and separated from the rest. Think about the ways you see this happen, because it's very easy for us as Christians to sit in here and say, oh, the LGBT agenda, the, the homosexuality, the pride parades, the transgenderism, where they're trying to make boys be girls and girls be boys. We can pretty clearly see that distinction, but sometimes we're so immersed in a culture that we don't see all of the subtle ways that it's happening. And one of the other things that does happen is there's this window of discussion. And when you can see the extreme end of that window, you say, oh, well, yeah, of course, I don't like that. I'm against that. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not going to that end of the window. But when that extreme end is so far over there, you can be moderate and not realize you've come halfway to where Satan wants you. You're already leaving the, the, the ground that God planted you on to grow closer to that, that agenda that Satan has to pull us away from our families, to pull us away from our communities, to atomize us. So how do you see this? You go out to dinner and you see a family and they've got their kids, and the kids are sitting there with an iPad in their face. Everyone in the family has their own little entertainment unit going on. They're not talking to each other. They're not spending time together. There's, there's no connection there. It's you've got yours, mom and dad are in their phone, and, and they're there as a family. They're, they're all physically around the same table. Mentally, they're all a thousand miles apart. Man, you see this everywhere you go of people that don't connect with each other at all because their connection is with something else. Individually, they've already chosen where they want to be connected, and it's not where they were placed. But see, your kids don't exist for the next video game update. They don't exist for the next hot app that is coming down uh, you know, uh, to their tablet, to their phone, to whatever game it is they want to play. That's not what they're here for. We don't know what they're here for, and so we just fall for those things. You think about the, the next generation, uh, the young adults, and I was going to say my generation. I, I don't get to be a young adult anymore, unfortunately. I've kind of grown out of that. But the, the young adult generation, what are they told? They're told, you know what, your 20s are for you, you know, travel and, and food and, and the Instagram lifestyle and you know, get all these streaming services. And in fact, my sister-in-law, she, uh, she and my brother got married young and she had a, a woman in the church, an older lady, come and tell her, you are making a big mistake getting married young. What you need to do for the next 10 years, literally her entire 20s, is go travel and have experiences. And your 20s are for you. What do we call that? That's selfishness. That's individualism. That's I live for me and what I want rather than others around them. And, and you look and they're, they're on their fourth child is, is on the way as well. And they have this beautiful family. And what that lady was telling her is don't do that. That's not a useful use of your time. Go have fun for yourself. You are going to be separated from your parents. You're going to be separated from your future husband, separated from the children you would have had. It's about you. You're atomized. You're separated from everything that you could have had, everything that maybe God had in mind for you. And so that's what they preach to people in their 20s and their 30s. But then you go to the, the middle age, and it's working for the weekend, working for retirement. And it's all about the vacations or getting a boat or getting a, you know, whatever, the, the, the toys that you want to go do those things until you can get to retirement. And then when you get to retirement, it's all right, you've made it. You're here for just whatever you want. And you see that bumper sticker every now and then, I'm spending my kid's inheritance. Proverbs says wisdom, the wise man, leaves an inheritance for his children. We're not wise people. We're foolish people to think it's all here for me. I'm going to do whatever I want, live however I want. I'm, I'm obligation free when I hit 65 years old. Some of the, the church leaders I talk to, sometimes some of the hardest people it is to get involved in the work of the church is the people that have all the time in the world on their hands, but they say, you know what, I worked hard for a long time and this time is for me. At every generation, what is the message being told to kids, to young adults, to people in their middle age, to uh, seniors? You, 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 you. You're an individual. You're an atomized unit of society. It's all about you. 
And so you start noticing other things in the culture. Whatever happened to the family movie? I remember as kids, we'd go to the movies, and there, it was a movie that my parents could enjoy and that we would enjoy, that, that it was not above our heads, it didn't have things that kids shouldn't be seeing, but it was also a thing that we could watch together and enjoy together. Now, all the kids' movies are made for about a five-year-old level, and it, it drives the parents crazy, or it's got all kinds of stuff in it that even adults shouldn't be watching. You think about the, the family TV show, and, and for years there were sitcoms that you could sit around the TV and watch together. There's not hardly a thing on TV a Christian family can get, sit down and watch together without there being some problem, something put in front of them that they probably shouldn't be watching. Even sports. I grew up watching, uh, I was in Denver, Colorado, grew up watching the Denver Broncos, watching the Colorado Avalanche, all of our teams. That's just what we did. We'd put on the game at night. We'd watch, we'd watch our team. Now, when I'm watching the game with my kids, we've got to turn it away when the commercials come on. We've got to turn off the commentary. There's all the ads you know, that, that have raunchy material in them. There's horror movie ads that are showing horrific things. And my, my little girl says, Daddy, am I supposed to close my eyes? No, Daddy needs to turn the TV because I, I shouldn't have this in front of you. There's no family material left anymore because nobody cares about the family anymore. I noticed uh, about 10 years ago, the late night comedians started every year making jokes about, oh, Thanksgiving's coming up. You gotta go spend it with your racist parents, your racist uncle, oh, you gotta go spend it with these people that you don't like. We're gonna invent Friendsgiving so you can spend it with the people you actually like, and then, I know, you gotta go spend it with your toxic family. Why do we hate the family so much? Because Satan hates the family. Satan tells you your family is, is not worth investing in, and life is about you. You can go down a million of these. Uh, all the TV shows where mom and dad, the kids' TV shows where mom and dad just aren't cool. They are the most uncool people in the world. All of the, the TV shows going back to Archie Bunker and Homer Simpson of the dad is a bumbling idiot and the mom has to hold everything else together because if not for her, boy, the whole family would just fall apart. Why? Because Satan hates the family. Satan hates the structure that God has set up for us. We see a, a refusal to honor parents you talk to, I've talked to school teachers across the country these days, and they say, look, I've been teaching for decades. Kids are different. Something changed. Of course, kids are, aren't different. Kids come into this world knowing nothing. It's the way we view kids that is different. And it's the way that they're being raised and the way they're being trained to not honor the people that came before them, to not have that respect. And then you see that generationally where they grow up, and uh, a few years ago that phrase, OK Boomer, came out, which was just a, a young person's dismissiveness towards anyone older than them to say, I, I don't have to listen to you. You're just a, you're a washed up old boomer. But then there's the other side, and, and don't get me started on this, the, the memes that older people will share on Facebook of, boy, we could just cripple this entire generation if we put everything in cursive and changed every car to stick shift. Like, yeah, why doesn't anybody know that? Because you didn't teach them. You didn't pass your knowledge along, and now they don't respect you, and we've got this generational war that goes on of, and of course, generations have always not really understood each other. My dad didn't understand my music. His mom didn't understand his music. That happens. But the disrespect, the idea that we don't really need each other, that we're separated from each other, and man, every generation is looking at the other one with contempt. Leviticus 19.32, one of the things that was commanded them in the law was stand up before the gray head. Honor the people that are older than you. You read through the Proverbs and all of the things it talks about of the joy of parents is in their, their children and raising children and the, the honor and the, the respect that comes from the children of the parents, but the parents' joy that they take in the children. And now, you go, oh, I just can't wait till they're 18. Just can't wait to get them out of the house. Or every year when it's back to school season, oh man, now finally the mom's posting their picture on Facebook of cheering while the kids are going back to school. Does anybody want these kids? Does anybody care about them? And it's no wonder they grow up and say, I don't respect you, okay, boomer, I don't want anything to do with you. Satan has done a marvelous job of attacking the family. And you say, well, does, does any of this matter? Does uh, the TV shows, the, the, the quips back and forth, the generational stuff, does it matter? Yeah, we're 50 plus years in to no-fault divorce laws here in America. Look at the havoc that has come out of it. It's, that was the beginning of the cascade down to today. Because when you introduce no-fault divorce, when you say that you can enter in and out of marriage on a whim, just because you, it doesn't work for you anymore, because you're not happy anymore, when you move, remove the commitment, which is the backbone of marriage, what else happens? Every family becomes an every-man-for-himself unit. If it's, I'm here until I'm not happy with it anymore, I'm here until I don't think it's really serving me anymore, you've placed yourself at the center of everything, 
And here we are. It's atomization. It's breaking everybody down into their individual parts. So what God said in Genesis 1 is when the two get married, what do they become? One flesh. If there's no fault divorce and you don't actually have to commit, that there's no real entanglement there, but, but you just kind of tentatively for a little while while, you're, while you enjoy it, you kind of are going to walk alongside each other until you decide to go different directions, you're not one flesh. And so from that, adultery uh, was, used to be a crime, believe it or not, in, in many states. It's been decriminalized all over the country because we're not going to hold anybody to their, their vows. You're going to get up and say a vow before God and before the state and, and all those things. But, I mean, come on, if, if, if you're not really feeling it, you don't have to actually keep that vow. We're not going to expect that out of you. And then from there, 1973, just a few years after no-fault divorce, you had abortion legalized. Since that time, divorce rate, divorce rate you'll often hear 50% of marriages end in divorce. It's very hard to nail down what the actual number is. It's likely over 40% of first marriages end in divorce. The problem is a lot of those people go on to second and third, and the rate on those is astronomical, is well over 50%. And so all kinds of marriages ending in divorce. A few years ago, there was a headline, and it, at first you look at it and go, that's great. It says divorce rates are down. You know why divorce rates are down? Because people just don't get married anymore. They cohabitate. They say, I'll move in with you, but I'm not signing any paperwork. This way, it's just way easier when we decide this doesn't work for us after a few years, and we'll go our separate ways. Yeah, we might have had kids, and it might mess them up for life when we kind of go our separate ways, but yeah, you didn't actually expect me to commit, did you? And so we have, again, this society that, that starts going through the 70% of couples before they're married live together. Now we've got a, a statistic where 40% of children born in this country, four out of every 10 children that are going to be born today in America will be born to a couple that is not married. That's not how it was intended to be. That was not God's plan for the family. That is an atomized society that is broken down to where there's no commitment from anybody. That leads to a birth rate that is 1.6, which is below replacement rate. It leads to a million abortions a year. It leads to a place where 20%, one in five uh, adults today say, I don't even want children. I am, you know, that, that bloodline that continues all the way back to Adam and Eve and then survived on the ark and came through Noah and, and all the way there, they led to me today to have a good time and then die and that's the end of it. Because I don't really want to participate in that. I am here for me, individualized atomization. Of course, we are not talking about those that aren't married. We're not talking about those that, that can't have children. We're talking about those that are saying, nah, I, I, that's not really for me. I'm not participating in this whole society thing. I'm not participating in this whole family thing. Eh, that's just, I'm not really feeling that. Why? Because Satan has done a really good job of putting it in our head that none of those things really have value. What has value is what makes me happy today doesn't work that way. But we can't fix the world. That's one of the things that we as Christians have to realize as we look at these things, and it's important to name them and say, this is all wrong. But then we can come in here and say, oh man, things sure are bad out there. All right, let's, let's get up and sing our song, and then we'll go home. That doesn't do us much good. I preached on Nehemiah a couple weeks ago uh, in my home congregation. And when you look at that, they've got the city, the city walls of Jerusalem have all fallen down. And Nehemiah sees that problem and says, we've got to do something about this. And of course, if you're Nehemiah and you've got great influence and, and power, all right, maybe you can do something about the world. Most of us can't. So what Nehemiah got the people to do was say, we're going to rebuild the wall. You've all got your houses. The section of the wall that's in front of your house, that's yours. You build that up. Don't worry about the other guy. Don't look across the city and go, wow, they're not doing their job over there. You worry about your wall. You build up your wall. So as we talk about fortifying the family this week, that's what I want to focus on, is building up your wall. You might have single people in here. We might have divorced or widowed people in here. We might have uh, people that are about to get married, people that just got married, people that have married, been married for a number of years, people who have kids, people who don't have kids, people whose kids have, have uh, grown up and, and left the house, people who maybe someday will have kids, people across the spectrum. And so uh, there's going to be something for everybody in this. But it's about building the wall in front of your house. It's about handling your own responsibility and contributing to make things better. Because if we in the church don't make things better, we really can't look outside of the society around us and go, man, you guys got to get your act together. Well, you guys, you, you guys, you got all of these problems because all of these things that we see outside of the church, they creep into the church. These, these issues that, that we can't fix out there, they come in, this 
atomization. We have Christians that divorce, fornicate, and commit adultery and view pornography at incredibly high rates. It's not too far behind the world in all of those statistics. We've got to build the wall in front of our own house. Before we preach to the world about what's wrong out there, we've got to build the wall in front of our own house. We have Christians who devalue marriage and children. We have Christians losing over 50% of our kids to the world, that, that they grow up and they won't be in church when they're adults. That's one of the saddest things, one of the statistics more than anything that we have to get fixed and we have to reverse because we can get in here and we can, we can have everyone in this room say amen and commit and do the right thing and if we all do really well and the next generation doesn't pick it up, if it's not passed on, we just bought ourselves a little bit more time. You see that in the Old Testament with Israel where a king would come along and he was a good king and he'd, he'd make reforms and he'd say, we're getting rid of the idolatry. We're getting rid of all the things we're not supposed to do. We're going to start worshiping God again. And what happened every single time? It says, and then his son became king and his son brought the idols back. His son didn't continue in the reforms. His son didn't. And so everything we talk about, if, if we don't pass it on to our kids, but man, I go to churches all over the country where there are people 40, 45 and up there might be a few kids, grandkids that are coming along with them, uh, some, a couple of young couples, but by and large, 15 to 40 is the smallest demographic in every church I ever attend, every church I've been to. We've missed almost two generations. If we're going to rebuild this, if we're going to fortify the family, we've got to make sure we don't lose any more first. If your boat is sinking, before you start mapping it out and going, all right, where are we going next? The first thing you've got to do is patch that hole in the boat. So we've got to make sure we're getting that right, and then we've got to handle our own business to go forward better than we had before. But as I said, Christians have been immersed in this culture. We don't even realize just how much of this atomized culture we've adopted, how much we've bought into. I was mentioned that, that uh, one of my podcasts is called Think Deeper Podcast, and every week we just talk about real-world issues that affect Christians, the Christian home, the Christian culture, and, and, and things going on around us and how to think through them from a biblical worldview. Most of the negative feedback we get, most of the, the ways we make people angry, is simply when we read Bible verses about the family. Is when we say, well, the Bible says this, and man, people go crazy. It's kind of funny, coincidentally, the, the Bible copy I picked up to bring with me today. If you go to 1 Peter 3.21, we're not going to turn over there, uh, but if you go there, where it says, baptism now saves you. This Bible has footnotes, like many Bibles do. It has three pages of footnotes after that why it doesn't actually mean what it says. Well, it doesn't actually mean baptism saves you because it can't mean that. Well, maybe it just means what it says. The same thing happens when we read Ephesians 5 and we say it says, Wives, submit to your husbands. The husband is the head of the home. We start getting Christians going, well, it doesn't actually mean that. And let me give you this really long explanation as to why it doesn't. That, that's what it says. It says it multiple places, but Christians, we get... A number of them not really happy about that. We've said that marriage is a, is a good thing and should be desired by most people. Most people were not built to be single their entire lives. And people were in 1 Corinthians 7, Paul says, yeah, and Paul said, for a limited time, this is probably a good thing that most don't get married, but he says, I realize most of you aren't going to be able to do that. Most of you are going to burn with passion. You should probably go get married. You go back to Adam and Eve, marriage was God's desire for your families. We say children are good and should be desired, and you get people saying, well, no, it's an individual couple's choice. Was that God's intent? Was God intending for us to say, you know what, let's decide if we want to have kids or not. If that were the case, he would have made us biologically able to decide. It's only through recent science that we can say, eh, I don't really want to do that. Married couples have children. That was God's design. Where we see in, in 1 Timothy 5 and in Titus chapter 2, it says, Older women teach younger women to be keepers at home. And you read that one and people go, whoa, hang on now. Again, you go to 1 Peter 3 where it talks about the, the husband being the head and Sarah called Abraham Lord. And man, the, the feminized, feminist culture that we have, people get really, really upset when you read those verses. Why? Who discipled us? Who gave us our beliefs? Do we get them from the Bible? And we take those into the culture and we look at the culture and say, well, the Bible says this, so let's analyze the culture with it. Or do we get our beliefs from the culture and we go to the Bible and say, let me fit my culture into the Bible and write out three pages why that really simple Bible verse doesn't mean what it says. You've got to make a choice. Who's discipling whom here? Which direction are we taking? Are we casting a Christian worldview on the world or are we casting a worldly worldview on the Bible? 
Let's go to Genesis 12. We're going to look at a couple things in Genesis. Genesis chapter 12. Now that we've diagnosed the problem, now that we've gotten to this idea of atomization, and this idea that you exist for you, you get to decide if, if marriage is something you want, great. If, mar if children are something you want, great. And if not, do your own thing. Do whatever makes you happy. And if marriage is ha good for you for a while, and after a while it's not, take off. Just, you know, give up on it. Okay, do what you got to do. No, all of these things that we're told don't matter. We're at the center of God's promise to create a people for himself. Genesis 12. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go forth from your country, from your relatives, from your father's house, to the land which I show you. And I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great. And so you shall be a blessing, and I will bless those who bless you. And the one who curses you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Interestingly, you see Abraham first, he's Abram at the time, Abraham first leaving his family. Why was he leaving his family? To form a new family, because in our, uh, the scripture that was read earlier in Joshua 24, he said, are you going to worship the gods that your father served across the Euphrates? Abraham came from a pagan, idolatrous family. God says, you're going to get away from them. But then look at the promises. I'm going to give you a land. I'm going to make your name great. I'm going to bless you with this, this seed, uh, as he goes on later, and the promise of Isaac. And that promise keeps getting more specific. And you're going to have children in this great nation. And in, in chapter 15, of like the sand of the seashore, like the stars of the sky, you're going to have people everywhere come forth from you. That was the blessing. He didn't say, Abraham, you know, if you want, you can go over here. You know, it's a pretty good vacation spot, and we're going to have some cool streaming services for you. And if, if you want to get married and have kids, great. And if you want to do it, and said, no, your blessing, the greatest blessing that was ever promised to a human being was promised here to Abraham where he says, every nation in the world is going to be blessed because of you and the children and grandchildren and the family that comes from you. You're in this room today because of this promise to Abraham. These things matter. These things that Satan says, well, if, if it works for you, great, and if not, don't worry about it. These things matter. These things are important to God. These things are, are things that he wants us to focus on as being part of that family and carrying it forward. Go back to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. Interestingly, we looked at all the ways Satan has attacked our culture Look throughout the Bible. What does Satan always do? As I said before, separating the prey from the herd, he separates Adam, Eve and, and starts speaking to her. He's not tempting Adam. He's talking to Eve to get both of them to fall, and she does. Cain and Abel, same thing. It says sin is crouching at your door, and its desire is for you. Satan's trying to get you, Cain. And says, What does Cain say? Am I my brother's keeper? Cain was atomized. He was separated from his family. and says, That's not my business. I'm going to kill my brother. I'm not his keeper. It's not my responsibility. It doesn't work for me. I'm not interested. So you've got Adam and Eve. You've got Cain and Abel. We, with Noah and Ham and, and Canaan, that curse that comes on after the flood. Abraham's family himself, Sarah, Hagar, Ishmael, Isaac, that, that fracturing that comes about. Jacob and his sons and, and his multiple wives and the, the polygamy and the, the issues that were caused by that. And the sons turning on Joseph and throwing him into a pit and pretending he was dead. I mean, bad things happen. There are very few actual good examples of a family in the Bible. Why? Because when Satan sees God at work, he says, the way I can shortwire this is by tearing the family apart. You've got to realize that. You have to internalize that and say, Satan wants me atomized. He wants me separated from my family, separated from my church family, to think that I exist for me, and, and, and that's how he's going to pick me off from the herd. We look at Genesis 1, we see man's purpose when God created us and put us here. In verse 26, Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And God created man in his own image, in the image of God he created him. Male and female he created them. And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Then God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the surface of all the earth, and every tree which has fruit yielding seed, it shall be, good for, or it shall be food for you. And every beast of the earth and every bird of the sky and everything that moves on the earth which has life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw all that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. God made man and said, this is very good. You carry on one chapter over into chapter 2. Briefly, let's read verse 20. 
and following. The man gave names to all the cattle and to the birds of the sky and every beast of the field, but for Adam there was not found a helper suitable for him. So the Lord God caused, it, caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept. Then he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh at that place. And the Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man. And the man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. For this cause a man shall leave his father and his mother and shall cleave to his wife and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. You see God saying, I'm going to create them in my own image and in my own likeness giving them dominion, authority. We're, we're the top of the food chain. We're the, the most important creature on earth. He's given us souls. He's put eternity into our hearts. He's, he's made us different. And at the end of this day of creation, unlike the rest, he says, this is very good. This is the crowning achievement of creation, was to make man, for man to see, I, I, I need a helper here. I need to not be alone and to give man a woman. And so now you have the first family. And God says they're one flesh. They are together, and that's the design for Ever and ever is one man, one woman for life, becoming one flesh. They are to be fruitful and multiply. They are to exercise dominion. That they're going to have a, a sphere of influence that is under them. Adam and Eve, it was the whole world. For you and me, it's, it's something a little bit smaller. But you have your own area in which God expects you to take dominion as well. You've got your own things that God expects you to rule over as well. And yet, we've been severed from all of these things. We don't think of ourselves in this way. So it's a bit cheesy as I was thinking about this sermon. I thought, man, this problem of atomization, what we need is Adam, A-D-A-M-ization, which is for man to look at his wife and say, you know what, together we've got a job to do for God. We are going to bond together on that mission for God. We're going to love one another. We're going to raise a family unto God. We are going to continue on this, this quest of populating the earth. Because when you look at the Great Commission where Jesus sent his disciples out to do it, it's a spiritual version of this exact same thing, to take dominion. Jesus says, all authority has been given me in heaven and on earth. Jesus rules over everything. He says, take this and train the nations. Take this everywhere you go. So you've got the physical, you've got the spiritual. We've got this mission that we're supposed to carry out, but you're told you don't have a mission. Your mission is do what feels good. Which way is it going to be? I had a whole lot more to get to. I'm going to have to save it for the, for the next lesson because... Uh, this is actually the first time I've given this set of lessons, and I could keep you here all morning long. We're going to stop right there. But you think about what Adam was called to do, and then he didn't do it. He didn't rule. He didn't teach the, the law with his, his wife. In fact, Eve misquotes it as the first thing she does when the serpent tempts her, and they fell. Then you go to, to Deuteronomy 6, and as Israel gets ready to go into the promised land, Moses gives them the blueprint and says, You've got the law. Fathers, grandfathers, teach this. Pass it on. You aren't here to just enjoy this land flowing of milk and honey with yourself. You're here to take this land and have it be in our families for generation after generation after generation. You want a thousand generations to live in this land. And what happened? The same generation committed to Joshua and said, hey, yeah, as for us, we're going to serve the Lord. And Joshua basically tells them, no, you're not. And they don't. You go to the book of Judges and it immediately spirals into chaos. Adam and Eve failed. Joshua and, and the people that went into Canaan failed. Over and over, David failed. Uh, you see failure after failure after failure of the family. But there's one difference for you and me. We're on this side of the cross. We're on this side of Jesus Christ. We have the word given fully. We've got the spirit. We've got everything that we need to realize what God is asking for us and to commit to it. But what that's going to take is a serious counterculture commitment to say, I've got to retrain my mind. I've been baptized into a culture that hates the family that hates the posterity that God uh, intends us to leave, that hates the idea of, of connecting and blessing others and living for somebody other than ourselves, that hates the idea of sacrificial living, of being a, a cog in a machine that's bigger than ourselves. There's a song I love that came out, I don't know, 10 or so years ago. It's a group called Fleet Foxes. I'm not a big fan of theirs, but they, they start the song by saying, I was raised up believing I'm somehow unique, like a snowflake unique among snowflakes. That was before that term snowflake really became an insult. But they're saying, man, my parents told me, you're, you're special. You're going to stand out. You're going to be special. But he goes on to say, now that I'm, I'm raised, I think I'd rather be a cog in a machine. Something, you know, a functioning part in a, I'm butchering the lyrics, uh, something greater than me. You were created to be a piece in something that is way bigger than you. You were created to, to not stand out and, and, boy, this is my life. But we've got our Facebook profiles, our Twitter profiles, our Instagram profiles. 
TikTok, I'm too old for that. So some of the, the people in here, I'm sure, have their TikTok profiles, which is to say, broadcast yourself to the world. Show the world how unique you are. No, you're a part of something bigger. And that's the most blessed thing you could have, is to be part of God's family, is to be part of your family, is to be part of, of moving forward this thing that began with Adam and Eve, came through Noah, came through David, came through Abraham, came through Jesus to you today. It's kind of like when you, every four years you see them start carrying the Olympic torch and you know, a guy runs it a quarter mile and then passes it to somebody else and he runs it a quarter mile and he runs it a quarter mile. Nobody really remembers any of those guys in there. Any of those men and women that take the torch and run it for a quarter mile, there's a thousand of them that get it from one place to the next and then they light the big flame at the end. It's your job to carry the torch that was passed to you at birth. Again, you came into this world with a few things given to you. Your job is to take those things, make something of them for God, pass them on to your children, grandchildren. If you don't have children or grandchildren, pass them on. Be a father to the fatherless, to, to be involved in the work of the Lord in some way so that when you die, you don't go, man, I got to stand here and hold the torch and do whatever I wanted with it. No, I moved things forward. I helped the mission of Jesus, the mission that was given to Adam, spread throughout the earth to take dominion where God told me to do so. That is a really cool thing. That's what you were designed for. We're not a happy culture. We're not a mentally well culture. Why? It's because we're not doing what we're designed for. If we want to get that right, we've got to give up atomization and start doing what Jesus called us to do. If you haven't followed Jesus, you can't even start to begin to be part of this. You need to put him on in baptism. Repent of your sins. Give up the ways of the world and say, I'm going to follow Jesus. If you have become a Christian, but you're still following the world, Make the commitment. I'm not a big fan of the invitation, stand and sing, coming forward, any of that stuff. If you want to do that, absolutely, the invitation's open. More than anything, pray about it. Think about it. If you need to talk to an elder, if you need to, to think through, what does this mean for me? Take that time and figure out, what am I going to do about this? How am I going to commit to be part of God's plan? If there's any need, come as we stand and sing.